can you walk us through kind of the headline? What's kind of that eye catching or grabbing segment of, of Merit Beauty? Yeah, th this was a really interesting podcast to prepare for because you read a couple articles and the story goes something like this. Uh, the founder, Catherine Power, uh, posted an Instagram a video a few years ago about her five minute beauty routine. And she had a couple followers. They really liked it. It launched a business. Uh, she launches it in 2021. All of their SKUs are priced, you know, around $25. And two years later, they're doing $100 million in sales. And it, it's really interesting because those are the cliff notes. And that is all completely true. But the actual story is so much more rich. And I think to first really understand merit, you have to understand the founder. So Catherine, where she came from when she went through. And that, that's where I think we want to start. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, so Catherine Power, the cliff notes on her in particular is she's a serial entrepreneur, but specifically really in cosmetics. So she was born in Orange County. She was really into dancing and ballet and jazz as a kid. Um, she was really influenced by her grandmother and her great grandparents were in the film industry um, and they had a love for for that you know industry. Um, but because of how competitive she was with dance, she started doing like an independent study by the eighth grade and planned on being a film producer. Um, and so her plan was to go out to Santa Monica Co College, and then she transferred to USC Film School. But on her first day at uh, Santa Monica College, she showed up early, drove around for 45 minutes and couldn't find parking. So she decided that school wasn't for her. And I think that kind of just showcases a bit who Catherine is. I mean, imagine you're signed up to go to college and your parents are thinking you're gonna go to college, you drive around on your first day trying to find parking for 45 minutes and you can't. And so you decide school isn't for you. I'm not quite sure what was going through her head at that time, but that is just such a fascinating story about, you know, who Catherine is, uh, especially yeah. at that age. I, I want to know what the conversation to her parents was after that, you know, like, Hey, I'm not going to college. Uh, and the reason was, is because I couldn't find a parking spot. I just, uh, <laughs> I'm sure they pulled out a little bit of hair. Yeah, yeah. But so then the story goes. So they call Touchstone Pictures and said that she's willing to work for free Monday to Friday, nine to five. And she started working for a producer who ended up hiring her as an assistant. She then left Touchstone, started working with Brent Bolthouse, who was a special events producer and nightlife promoter. Um, her work helped Brent get hired by uh, Ellie Magazine, which is a you know big publication, um, and met Hillary Kerr, a co-worker at Ellie, and in 2005, they started a newsletter called Who, What, Where, and that's where, like what you're wearing. This quickly turned into a fashion blog, which led to the creation of Click Brands, and Hillary Kerr currently has a very popular podcast called Second Life. So she definitely did not follow the tr traditional path here when it comes to, you know, education, uh, which I think, you know, if you think about a lot of entrepreneurs, I mean, most or many of them do not, you know, follow that traditional path. I mean, why do you think this ended up working out for her, Aaron, when, when a lot of times it doesn't for other founders? I mean, what does this tell us about who Catherine is? You know, I, I think that she would probably tell you that luck had a lot of uh, a lot to play at this. I can imagine that if there was anyone else who was listening and said, you know what, I'm going to do exactly what she did. There's a lot of things that lined up. Uh, one, you know, she was in Southern California where it was celebrity rich and, you know, she was able to make these connections uh, that led her into these situations where she was able to meet people that turned into co-founders and business partners and all these sorts of things. Um, but I, I think that the lesson that anybody can take away from is to kind of be grateful for what you have at the moment you have it. I mean, I'm sure that when she uh, was working at Touchstone and it was, you know, month three and she wasn't getting paid and was getting stressed out because she was running errands and she probably thought, man, this stinks, right? You know, this isn't something that I want to do. I envision my life being different, but I feel that at least looking back, she took a longer term perspective and was focusing on the relationships that she was building and the things that she was learning, knowing that the role that she was in wasn't a forever role. And I think that that is, is really the lesson I take from that of, of really anybody is even if you're in a difficult situation right now, it's, it's, it's just temporary, right? Like you're going to get a new job. You're going to have a new opportunity. And so focus on the things you can take with you. And that's the relationships that you have. Yeah, I agree. That's a great, great takeaway. And I think too, like this transpired into really the start of what became her, you know, entrepreneur career. 
uh, you know, starting who, what, where, and then click brands. So in 2006, they started click brands, which was basically like a media company that focused on daily fashion and fashion news. Uh, to me, it seems kind of full circle almost, because if you look at kind of these newsletters that have sprouted out and, and had a lot of success the past few years uh, of this decade, it seems like this was kind of what was happening in the fashion sphere in 2006. Um, but they go on to, to run click brands really until 2000 or, or up until 2012, they continue to run it. And then they raise some funding to test out different ways to you know, monetize their audience. So it seems like that kind of six year period, they're mostly focused on growing their audience, you know, focused on events, focused on more, you know, kind of, I guess, organic sponsorships and ways to make money. And then they realize, hey, we have this really loyal, engaged audience. We should maybe go out and raise money and actually launch some of our own brands. And so um, they raise four million, a $4 million Series A led by Graycroft. Um, and Catherine officially becomes the CEO of Click Brands, and that was in 2014. And then in 2015, they raised a Series B of $8 million. And, you know, this kind of, I guess, transpired into this little conglomerate of cosmetic brands. And so I'm just curious, Aaron, from, from your perspective, I mean, do you think they started with that loyal audience and then, you know, their executive team probably saw how sizable and how engaged their audience was and then said, hey, you know, we should go raise some capital to launch these brands internally. I mean, what, what do you think that discussion was like with their team at that time? You, you know, it's it's a great question. I'm sure that it was a mix between, hey, what we're doing isn't quite working, right? We're, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work. We're getting a lot of views and clicks and likes and subscribes, but we're eating ramen over here. I'm, I'm sure that was part of that was was true on that end. And then the other end was like, hey, we've really built some authority here. We look at fashion all the time. We can tell what's going to do well, what's not going to do well. Why don't we do, you know, why don't we take a, a swing at it? Because I, I think that with a founder, there's always a little bit of like arrogance in, in the most positive way that you can be arrogant, where it's always a question of why not me? Why, why not us? Right. And, and I think that that played out here where they had built a very successful subscriber base. and. They were looking at these other brands popping up and said, why not us? And so I'm sure that was part of the, the conversation for why they wanted to jump in. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because I guess one of the first lines that they launched was in 2016, where they launched a line called Who, What, Where and Target, which was really focused on inclusive plus sizes, um, which, you know, to have a big retail partner like Target, it's a great partner to launch with, but it's a lot different than the strategy that we've seen, you know, them take uh, in, in today's world. And then in 2017, they raised a $15 million Series C led by Headline and Graycroft. And this, I think, is kind of shortly after where Click started really spinning out more and more, more brands that are relatively you know, well-known today in the cosmetics world. So 2019, they launched a Clean Beauty skincare company called Versed. Um, and 2020, they launched a clean wine company with Cameron Diaz called Alva Line, is that how you say it? A V A L I N E. And um, after six years leading Click, Catherine steps away in 2020. Um, and this was after 14 years at Click Brands. So Click Brands goes on to be acquired by Future Publishing in July 2022 for $127 million, which is pretty incredible because it seems like kind of one of these early companies that we've seen be this like hybrid media business that starts by really growing a loyal audience and then successfully kind of incubating more and more products and brands that are attractive to their audience. I mean, it seems like a great strategy. And I feel like a lot of creators are doing that in today's market. You know, you look at Mr. Beast and Feastables and you look at the other products that he's rolled out. I mean, do you think that's kind of was their strategy? And it seems like it came to play because they had a you know, pretty nice acquisition for, you know, raising just, you know, tens of millions of dollars. It seemed like a decent outcome. Yeah, I'm sure the team was thrilled. You know, I think anytime you can work on something, let alone have a significant stake in something, but work on something that other people value at over a hundred million dollars, that just feels good. That gives you, that opens doors, right? That, that, it, that gives you opportunities that you normally wouldn't have. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And so what's crazy about 
Catherine is that, you know, click is kind of just like the footnote to what she really goes on to achieve. So Aaron, do you want to kind of start telling what merit merits or origin story really looks like from here? Yeah, absolutely. This is just wild because, you know, I think about this and she spent 14 years at click, right? It exited for 127 million. Uh, for anybody else, that would be a career. That'd be something that they'd be very excited with. And that would be, they would retire and be done. But this was the warm up. This was the pregame for, for where she is right now. And with Merit specifically, she initially got the insight in 2019, but they didn't launch it uh, until 2021. Uh, the reason being is she was running two or three other companies at the time. Uh, but in 2019, she recognized that most brands were either celebrity back brands or brands that were created by makeup artists. And the actual application of these brands and, and how they were viewed by consumers was a little bit disjointed, right? The user was, was busy. Uh, they were craving something that was very easy. And thus, they kind of stumbled upon this impossible to mess up mantra. And... Uh, Merritt's founding SVP, uh, Leah Moran, uh, said in, in 2019 that Catherine called her and said, hey, I'm launching a beauty brand. And that was all that Leah needed to know. And she said that was, that was you know, something I knew was compelling there. And that, I think that just speaks to the power of, of Catherine's person, right? The fact that she could call someone and say, hey, I'm thinking about launching a beauty brand. And this person said, yep, I'm right there, whatever you need. And then not do it for two years is, is a really interesting thing. Um, but really, the, the void in the market that they identified was that there was this little white space for a luxury beauty brand, brand that was clean, well edited, and really was focused on this minimalist uh, aesthetic and, and trying to bring out people's natural beauty versus trying to couple it up. And so that's really the ethos of what they had when they went in and launched it. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty incredible because they go on to launch in January 2021 with this like D2C launch strategy. And it kind of stems from the original video that Aaron mentioned that you mentioned before in terms of like Catherine posting her five minute routine. I wonder, do you think her posting that on her Instagram was purposeful to get feedback? Or do you think it was like unintentional of just like, hey, you know, let's see if, if, if uh, this, this might work. You know, I'm just curious what you think. Was it intentional or unintentional? Yeah, I mean, anybody who posts something is doing it intentionally, right? So I, I think that, I, you know, maybe the thought was just to kind of engage with her following and, and you know, get some feedback. But I don't know if she thought she was going to launch a $100 million beauty brand by making a five-minute uh, morning routine video. So I think that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. But really, the, the secret sauce of this whole thing is really that they've been able to strike some sort of cross-generational appeal. And so their products and formulas appeal to Gen X as well as um, folks that are 45 and, and 55. Yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So January, 2021, they launched their D2C strategy, um, just really, you know, go off to the races. February, 2021, they do a Sephora launch. They launched into 400 Sephora locations. Um, and 800 doors, 800 Sephora doors by the end of 2021. Um, that's inclusive of Sephora USA, Canada, uh, and Sephora at Kohl's. And so the business kind of becomes 50% D2C, 50% retail. I mean, second year taking like this large of an omni-channel approach, what do you think about that? Because I guess on one hand, you know, you get that immediate distribution from a major cosmetic retailer like Sephora. On the other hand, you know, your wholesale margins aren't quite as strong, but you also, you know, don't have to deal with all the complications of selling your product D to C. I mean, I'm curious, what do you think that looks like from an operation standpoint to have 50% of your revenue, you know, coming from a, a large retailer like Sephora? It's probably an absolute dream, to be honest. The fact that you've got a balanced channel that's working and the fact that, you know, if CAC is, I mean, retail is all about momentum. And once you're in retail, and once people know about what's going on, like that just helps you grow. And the D2C is about building the brand. And so, you know, it's this great symbiotic relationship where the economics are probably just better in retail, right? Because you're not having to worry about acquisition costs or shipping or fulfillment. And then you also have this D2C spend that is accelerating the retail presence. And so I just want to go back to something that, you know, they didn't launch into retail in year two. They launched into retail in month two, right? Like 
Like they lost in January mm -hmm. and in February they're in Sephora. And that would only have happened because of, of Catherine's connections and previous experience running first, basically at the same time. And we'll kind of get into that a little, little bit later, but it is, it is just remarkable. The fact that they were able to get set up like this from the beginning and they just were shot of a cannon. It just, it worked almost too good. It's a beautiful case study. I mean, since their launch, they've sold a product every 17 seconds on their D2C website. So, yep, sold another one, sold another one. <laughs> uh, they've garnered more than 350 product reviews with an average rating of 4.87 out of 5. They've been tagging over 2,000 Instagram photos, and they've sold more than 100 of the five-minute morning sets in an hour. And so the cool thing about this is that their uh, full routine is, is really what they sell, and so that allows them to get a lot of uh, even distribution on their SKUs and people kind of buy the routine versus buying individual products. And so again, just to summarize, January 21, launched D2C, launched the business. February 22, launched into Sephora. And then in September of 21, they raised a $20 million Series A from El Caterton. And it's just it's just like, oh my goodness, like, what is this? This is, this is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it is unbelievable. I mean, I think that's, Kind of, I, I I missed that in in the notes by saying I think it was a, a year after because it was just so remarkable to have that quick of an expansion to go into Sephora. So January to February they go you know fifty percent into uh, Sephora from you know their sales perspective, which is insane. I wonder too how they finance those early Sephora orders though because you know they either had to factor them or they probably raised some money that they didn't disclose because. You know, they didn't disclose any financing before their $20 million Series A in September 21. And so, you know, to be able to expand into 800 stores in a year like that, you need capital. And so there's, you know, they had to either raise some capital when they were starting or put their own money in or, you know, maybe factored some of the POs. Just kind of curious what that actually looked like. Um and it sounds like, too, they've really right now started to be intentional about their international expansion. Do, do you want to kind of share notes around what that looks like in uh, 2022 and into 2023? Yeah. So just as a reminder, they, they decided to go international from day one because uh, they launched into Canada and the U.S. at the same time. And they've really been focused on making sure they're offering a fantastic D2C experience before they launch into a new market. And so they, the UK is, is kind of the big one that they launched into uh, in 21, 22. And what they did, which was interesting and a, and a good strategy is to localize the site. So their UK site is specific to the UK and it's not just a uh, US site with a slightly different spelling of, of some words. And so that was launched in 2023. In uh, 2022, they decided to branch out from just cosmetics into their first skincare product it was a serum called uh, Great Skin, I believe. And they, they launched in October of 2022, and they sold a unit every three minutes, despite being out of stock at Sephora and online from November to January. So let me just repeat that again. They didn't have any inventory from November to January, and they still sold an, a unit every three minutes. Like, that's just ridiculous. Can I fast forward 2023? They do $100 million in sales. And they... It's just, it, it's, just, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you look at how they did it as well. So they, they launched a, um, an eyeshadow and they posted a TikTok video on August 21st um, of, of this past year. And they just shared the product's manifesto, right? It's eyeshadow the user is actually going to use until it runs out. And in the first 24 hours, they had a million views, 175,000 likes. And now they've had, I think, 1.5 million views and 20, 225,000 likes with zero ad dollars behind it, right? They, they just... It's, it's kind of shooting fish in a barrel from an organic perspective. And uh, just recently, um, you know, about uh, six weeks ago from the recording of, of this podcast, uh, they brought in a, a new CEO. Uh, so Philippe uh, Pinatel, who's a 25 year veteran of, uh, of Mac Cosmetics. And he's coming in, he's gonna run the business and, and they think that this can be a billion dollar company. Uh, I mean, to be a hundred million dollars in 18 months, I think, like, yeah, that's probably a good, a good suggestion, but it's just, Phenomenal growth here, and I guess I'm I'm curious what your reaction is to that. And if you're Philippe, what are you thinking about your first year on the job? Yeah, I mean, what sticks out to me is when you're sold out and continue to sell that many units. Like, how do you then go and forecast what you should actually order, right? Because 
they're probably going back to their supplier like every day or at least every week and being like, Hey, actually we need, you know, X amount of more, more units. Right. And so that, that's what caught my eye because, you know, you hear about companies selling out a, a lot and typically then they don't really, you know, have many kind of, I guess, pre-order sales during that period, but Merit kind of, I guess, kept the channel going and continued to sell and was, you know, probably very transparent about, Hey, you know, this isn't going to ship for X amount of weeks. And I just wonder what those conversations were like with their manufacturer, because I've been in that situation before and it's so hard to navigate because like the manufacturer is kind of confused in terms of like what's going on here. And then, you know, you also are, are juggling the other side of it in terms of like, well, you know, how many orders are we actually going to get? And when is this going to slow down? And you're already you know out of stock. And so it's a really tough position to be in. Um, and so I think, you know, if I'm Felipe, you know, becoming CEO of Merit, I'm focused really on, on forecasting and cash management. I mean, those are probably top of mind, especially, you know, when, when selling out can slow down projected growth and, you know, cash flow can, can kill a business that's growing fast. And so I think those are kind of my two main focal points that I'd really dive into. It seems like they really have a strong social media strategy as we've seen in their TikTok and a pretty strong retail strategy. You know, I don't know what they're doing internationally, but maybe that's something they could look into uh, further as well uh, across, you know, the world. Um, but, you know, back to Catherine, I, I want, you know, Erin to really focus in on, on her story because none of this would be possible with without Catherine. And to go from zero to $100 million in revenue in like two years is insane. And I think it shows something again about Catherine's character where most people, you know, after they have an exit in an industry, if they're going to go build something, they're typically going to go build something in a different industry. They're not going to go back to that same industry and do something even bigger. And so I think that is another note I want to share about Catherine's personality. That was a big takeaway for me is she leaned into cosmetics, you know, and she had so much experience and a strong network in cosmetics and leaned in again by starting Merit and just knocked it out of the park. So let, let's dive in. Let's let's really do a deep dive on Catherine and kind of her timeline. Yeah, let's do it. it it's funny, as you were talking about uh, what it was like with, with being out of stock, with selling something every three minutes, I can only imagine what it was like to be the head of manufacturing or supply chain at Merit. And uh, when I when I checked last night, I was trying to figure out if the person was bald. Um, I don't know if the if the picture is is uh, old or not, but I would imagine that they lost at least some sleep with that. But uh, yeah, yeah the, diving into into Catherine, you know, we we shared this headline at the beginning of, hey, there was this woman. She had a couple of influencers uh, or a couple of followers. She posted a video. People liked the video. She started a company, hundred million dollars. Uh, but when you really start to look at it and you put all the pieces together, it's it's really, you know, Catherine, who is a celebrity connected CEO because of all the other work that she'd done. Uh, she's also a CEO who's built several other beauty brands and a me media company that had just sold for $127 million. And she had a personal following of 147,000 followers. That's who had the idea. And that's who posted this short Instagram video. And so it, it's one of those things where the, the way it's it's kind of framed in articles is that oh, this is anybody, right? But this isn't anybody. This is probably the most prolific entrepreneur of our generation, of, of someone who literally can do anything that they want. And she utilized her investor, retailer, and manufacturing relationships to basically fund Merit Beauty with just every possible advantage, right? The fact that they were launching into Sephora 30 days after they launched D2C, that doesn't happen unless you have all of this pedigree and all these things that come into it. And so you know, when, when I was looking through this, I was just became more and more impressed by what she has done and how she's done it. That I actually made a timeline, and we, we, we'll share this in the notes, but I was just looking at it from uh, the last, call it, seven years. Uh, and so I just want to walk through four different companies. Uh, so you've got Merit Beauty, Verst, Click Brands, and Abilene. And I'm just going to walk through these in, in kind of a different way. So in 2017, uh, it's just click brands, okay? And in 2017, she raised $15 million Series C. And in 2018, she's still running click brands. She's the CEO, but she has the idea for Verst, right? That clean skincare company. And she also has the idea for Avaline. And, you know, 
Okay, so now we go to 2019. She has the idea for Merit and she decides to launch first and she serves as the CEO. And so she launches a profitable uh, skincare brand in 2019 while still running click brands. In 2020, uh, she, you know, kind of focuses more on Verse. She decides to step down from click brands and Verse does about $5.3 million in revenue that first year. They expanded to Target and she launches Aveline. And so, you know, she's got, I think she can only run two companies at a time or has to run two companies at a time better. And so then we get to 2021. And okay, so at this point, she's evolved with, with Aveline selling the, the clean wine. She's the CEO of Verst. And then in 2021, she launches Merit as a CEO, $20 million Series A in the first year. Verst is doing $11 million in 2021. And it's just, you're kind of looking at this as like, all right, you know, has she figured out cloning? How is this happening? Like, this is this is just astounding. Uh, and then, you know, kind of advanced to 2022, uh, Verst is doing just under $20 million in revenue and Click is acquired for $127 million, right? So a uh, huge liqu liquidity event for her in 2022. 2023, Merit, like we said, is doing $100 million in sales. Verst is doing $40 million in sales. She decides to step down as CEO of Verst. And then in 2024, decides to step down as CEO of, of Merit. And so, you know, as I as I looked at all this, I had to double check that there were not multiple people named Catherine Power uh, and that she didn't have multiple twins or, or person, because this is amazing. To do any of these companies singularly would make you a wildly successful entrepreneur. To do all four of these in roughly the same amount of time is unprecedented. And, I don't think I've ever met anybody who has been as prolific as as this and has been able to figure it out than than Catherine. I I would I would love to meet her sometime. I'd love to ask questions and just be like, teach me what you know, because this is just mind blowing. But Nathan, you know, as I'm thinking through this, I had a couple of questions. And the first one is how hard of a sell do you think it was for the investors to give her money and let her run two adjacent companies at the same time? She must have had an incredible team that supported her to, to achieve, you know, all these outcomes with four different businesses is remarkable. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think honestly, it was market timing in terms of, you know, a lot of money flowing during that ZERP period, uh, zero interest. And number two, just, you know, the results of these brands are kind of speaking for themselves. You know, they're each growing at an incredible click, you know, Verst isn't growing quite as fast as Merit, but it goes from 5.3 to 11 to almost 20 million, which is still a great growth and uh, extremely, extremely uh, impressive. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's a good question. I, I would, you know, want to talk to her COO or chief of staff to understand, you know, how did they really put the pieces together behind the scenes? I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, I think the thing that, that's most remarkable, too, is it almost seemed that by adding more companies in the mix, her velocity increased. Right. You, you would expect that as you're splitting focus between Click and Verse, for example, that one or both would suffer. But it seems that she was able to do it in such a way that with each successive company she worked on, they became more and more profitable, higher revenue, hit milestones faster. And it was just this amazing tuition, so to speak, of the, again, to your point, the team that she had around her, the foresight that she had. And, you know, really one of the things that struck to me is, you know, she seems to have recognized her limits. And, you know, when you look at uh, the transition planning that she did, she's done a really, really good job of kind of planning for who's going to take over. And so you look at Click Brands, when she stepped down as CEO, she transitioned that role to her CFO, who'd been with the company for a long time. Uh, with Aveline, they transitioned the, the CFO to the CEO role. With Verse, they brought in a Dollar Shave Club executive who had been at J&J &J for a while, and they had a handoff there for about a year. And then with Merit, like we talked about, they, they brought in Philippe, who, uh, you know, had a, has spent 25 years with Mac. And so it's interesting where she's got kind of two models here, where at the beginning it was, let me promote, promote from within people who understand this business and these nuances very, very well. And then in the latter two companies, it's been more, let me go find someone with a great pedigree who has been where we want to be and let me bring them in and support them. And, and so, you know, I guess the second question I have when it comes to Catherine is, given that she appears to have this amazing self-awareness to know when it's time to leave and that she's leaving on her own terms, 
how do you think she knows when it's time to step away? That's that's a really good question too. I mean, yeah, I would think it stems from her self-awareness. I mean, I feel like the answer is almost in the question there where it stems from her self-awareness to understand, hey, I think I'm you know capped out in terms of my knowledge. We need to bring in someone that's taking this from a hundred to a billion, right? Which seems like to be the case of merit bringing in Felipe. I think probably similar dynamic with Verst. Um, and I think too, with Verst, it might've been something along the lines of her seeing the remarkable growth of merit and really wanting to, to focus more time there. But I mean, she is kind of like the Elon Musk of cosmetics, if you will. I mean, she really has had so much success within the cosmetics industry. And I mean that as you know, such a great compliment in, in terms of her capabilities because she knows how to execute. She knows how to raise capital. She knows how to put together the right team. And she knows how to see a gap in the market and solve these problems within the cosmetic industry. So I think it's it's remarkable to see what, what she's done. I mean, I feel like she could almost go on and do anything after this. What 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 do you think is next for her, Aaron? I think you're right. I think she can literally do whatever she wants. Um, you know, look, she's she's had a life changing amount of money with Click. Um, and again, I don't know how much of that she owns, but not zero percent. Uh, you know, she's also worked incredibly hard last couple years, and so maybe there's a part here where she is just going to downshift a little bit and just play the chairman role and, and do some angel investing or advising. Um, you know, I do know that according to her LinkedIn, she signed on as a partner with Graycroft in 2023. And so I'm sure that that's a relationship that she'll continue to, to get uh, satisfaction and, and you know, derive value from. But it is, it's literally something where she could do whatever she wanted. If she wanted to start a venture fund, she could do it. If she wanted to uh, get into politics, I'm sure she could do it. If she wanted to go into teaching or go back into dance or, you know, finally go to, to film school, she could do it. Um, she could also never work again if she did, if she wanted to. So it is, it's remarkable to have someone who is not yet 40, who, you know, I would imagine that if we were to do this podcast 10 years from now, we would look at merit as the footnote for what she's, you know, likely able to do.